Tonight, Congre devastation. Taiwan shuts down as strong typhoon Congre hits the largest storm to hit the island in nearly 30 years. The Northern Might, North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile test records longest ever flight time. Leaving behind, tens of thousands forced to flee Lebanon after continuous Israeli strikes blast historic cities. And timber resilience. Scientists in Japan are set to test the world's first wooden satellite in an early test for using sustainable material in space exploration. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are here to bring you key stories across the globe and we begin today in Taiwan. Typhoon Congre made landfall wrecking havoc across Taiwan with strong winds and heavy rain. It took the life of one foreign national in Nantau County as authorities evacuated thousands of people to safe shelters. Airplanes struggle to take off and land as Typhoon Kong Ray hits Taiwan. The strong typhoon made landfall on the island's east coast on Thursday. More than 300 flights have been cancelled due to the turbulent weather. All cities and counties in Taiwan declared a day off, closing financial markets and schools. The typhoon also knocked out power to nearly half a million households. Severe flooding inundated the island's remote areas, damaging vehicles and houses. In the northern city of Keelung, residents braced themselves for the largest storm by size to hit the island in nearly 30 years. This woman says she is worried that the water will flood her betel nut shop. At a port, a man says he may add additional ropes and strengthen the fortifications of his fish boat. In the eastern city of Hualien, high waves crushed coastal areas. Torrential rain in the mountainous area triggered mudslides. Administration forecaster Jean Huan said the storm will be much weaker after hitting the east coast. Nevertheless, people were advised to stay at home due to the danger of high winds. Almost 10,000 people have been evacuated from high-risk areas ahead of time, the island said. Subtropical Taiwan is frequently hit by typhoons. The last one, Typhoon Krathon, killed four people earlier this month. Kong Ray is forecast to graze China along the coast of Futiang province on Friday morning. A group of people have set fire to Jatia Party's central office in Dhaka amid growing tensions between members of the anti-discrimination student movement and the political party. There was no information if anyone was injured. Jati Party supported the country's ousted Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Following the incident, Hasnat Abdullah, one of the coordinators of the anti-discrimination student movement, wrote on his Facebook post, the ouster of national traitors is now certain. According to Fire Service Control Room Duty Officer Rashin bin Khalid, two units of the fire service were dispatched after a call was made. Jatia Party General Secretary Mujibul Haq Chunnu said in a statement that the whole nation is seeing what they're doing. Live videos on Facebook and media, everything happening out in the open and he doesn't want to say anything else. Additionally, Deputy Commissioner for Ramna Division Jewel Rana said that fire is now under control but a lot of students are still gathered. Eight people died in a large fire at a cooking oil factory near the Indonesian capital Jakarta. Around 20 firefighting trucks were at the site trying to contain the blaze. Footage from an eyewitness showed flames and billowing black smoke coming out of a building in centre of an industrial complex in Bekasi on the city of Jakarta's eastern edge. Media reports said roads had been closed around the factory. Suhartono, head of Bakasi's fire department, said all of the bodies had been evacuated from the site, adding that three other people were injured. But the number of casualties could still rise. Local authorities are investigating the cause of the fire. The factory is operated by PT Primus Sanus Cooking Oil Industry. North Korea is in the headlines again as it fired an intercontinental ballistic missile which flew for 86 minutes in the longest flight recorded yet. North Korea launched its longest flying intercontinental ballistic missile on Thursday. 
South Korea's initial analysis has shown that the missile is presumed to be a new solid-fuel ICBM, which, according to Japan, traveled a record 86 minutes, the longest flight time ever recorded by the regime. The missile also reached a record height of around 7,000 kilometers. Professor Kim explained that such a launch could put the entire U.S. within striking range. The provocation was anticipated by many as the U.S. is approaching its presidential election next week. However, another expert said there is more behind Pyongyang's motives. Meanwhile, Kim Jong-un's prompt comment on the weapons test is also seen as a rare move. Likewise, the North appears to have embedded several strategic aims behind its latest missile launch amid heightened security tensions in the Middle East and on the Korean Peninsula. Well, let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, both presidential candidates held late-night campaign events with four days left to go. Kamala Harris promises to fight for working people after being joined on stage by singer Jennifer Lopez in Las Vegas. However, early turnout in states like Arizona, Nevada and North Carolina also appear to favor Republicans, with the former president Donald Trump leading Harris in New Hampshire. From the Rat Pack to Elvis, from Fight Night to Fair, Las Vegas serves up spectacle bigger and brasher than anywhere else. The political circle came to Sin City as the U.S. presidential candidates Kamala Harris and Donald Trump held dueling campaign rallies. Recent polls from Atlas Intel show Trump holding a lead of 1 to 2 percentage points over his opponent. Trump's advantage in Pennsylvania has increased, rising from 0.4 points to 0.7 points. His lead in North Carolina has returned to last week's levels, now at 1.4 points. Trump is also gaining ground in Arizona, where he leads Harris by 2.4 points, and in Georgia, where his advantage is 1.8 points. The former president also predicted that he would win a record share of the Hispanic vote, saying that Hispanics want great jobs, rising wages and safe communities. Calling them great people and also praising their entrepreneurship, the president said he knows them to be great and really hard workers. Trump hurled sharp remarks at his Democratic opponent saying she lacked intellect and stamina to rule the country. At Harris's rally in Las Vegas, Jennifer Lopez addressed the comments made at Trump's Madison Square Garden rally earlier this week about Puerto Rico. Lopez added that Latinos make a difference in the election when united. The two candidates have somewhat similar schedules visiting largely the same states on the same days in the final sprint to the election. Vice President Kamala Harris is also swinging through the Midwest today, making stops in Janesville and outside Appleton, Wisconsin, where she also will hold a rally tonight. Over in the Middle East, Hezbollah rocket attacks on northern Israel killed seven people in agricultural fields near Metula and Haifa, marking what appeared to be the deadliest day in months for civilians in Israel. At least seven people have been killed in northern Israel after a barrage of Hezbollah rocket attacks from Lebanon. Israel's main emergency medical organization confirmed the deaths of a 30-year-old man and 60-year-old woman in the northern city of Haifa, hours after officials in Metula said that five people were killed. According to Israeli officials, the deaths in Metula on Thursday included four foreign workers. The attacks marked the deadliest strikes to hit Israel since its military invaded southern Lebanon earlier this month. Meanwhile, the Israeli military warned people to evacuate from more areas of southern Lebanon as airstrikes across the country killed at least eight. According to Lebanese government estimates, some 1.2 million people have been displaced since the Israeli escalation. Thousands from the historic Lebanese city of Baalbek and neighboring towns felt their homes as Israel continued bombing Baalbek and the coastal town of Tyre for the second consecutive day. These residents of Baalbek are fleeing to safety after Israel issued evacuation orders for several areas of southern Lebanon. Thousands from the historic town as well as from Douris and Ein Bordet are evacuating en masse and moving north to avoid the Israeli bombs. 
According to the head of the municipality's union of Deir El Ahmar, the influx of refugees has turned the roads leading to the city into a parking lot. Day strikes mark the second consecutive day of deadly Israeli bombings on Baalbek, its neighboring area, and the coastal city of Tyr. Syrian state media and an independent war monitor reported that Israel also carried out a strike across Lebanon's border in the Qasair area. They also come after the Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Mikati expressed optimism about a possible ceasefire being secured in the coming hours or days. According to Israeli media reports citing government sources, the plan brokered by the U.S. team would see Hezbollah forces retreat around 30 kilometers from the border north of the Litani River. Israeli forces would withdraw from Lebanon and the Lebanese army would then take charge of the border alongside U.N. peacekeepers. Moving over to the Russia-Ukraine war now, at least 35 people were injured and three people were killed after Russian troops bombed a residential building in Kharkiv. Moscow also fired 10 missiles at Dniester Estuary Bridge, which connects the north and southern areas of the Odessa region. A home in ruins and residents in shock. In the early hours on Thursday, Russian forces bombed a residential building in Kharkiv, killing at least three people, among them a 12-year-old, and injuring dozens of others. As emergency services work to rescue those trapped under the rubble, many residents are still in disbelief. Ukrainian authorities say Moscow's forces dropped a 500-kilogram glide bomb on the building. They also slammed the attack. Russia has increasingly used glide bombs to pummel Ukrainian positions across the front line as well as striking other targets. President Volodymyr Zelensky took to social media once again to urge the United States to allow Ukraine to use powerful long-range American missiles to strike air bases deeper in Russia. Meanwhile, Russia also targeted the Sumy region, killing at least three. The attacks have prompted Kyiv to retaliate with drone strikes of their own. Meanwhile, thousands of people are still without water and electricity in Spain after torrential floods lashed the eastern region this week, causing the most powerful flash floods in recent memory. At daylight on Thursday, clean-up efforts resumed. The early morning sun revealing collapsed roads, dozens of buried cars and a reminder of the nightmare they were living in. In parts of Valencia where a year's worth of rain fell in mere hours, people queued for non-drinking water to use for cleaning. The task daunting, the streets caked in mud, trucks and rubbish strewn everywhere. Residents were at a loss still trying to process what they had witnessed. Others described it like a tsunami, a wall of water descending suddenly. They said the civil protection issued mobile phone warnings too late, at 8pm when some streets had already turned to rivers. Motorists began to flee, only to find themselves submerged, suggesting the national weather alert system may have failed. The severity of the floods caused emergency services to scramble, and a thousand extra military personnel were sent in to save those they still could. The deadly floods, yet another earth-shattering reminder that the climate is changing, and with it comes more extreme weather events. Germany ordered the closure of all three Iranian consulates in the country following Tehran's execution of Iranian-German dual citizen Jashmid Sharmad. Sharmad spent four years in an Iranian prison on terror charges. Germany has ordered the closure of all three Iranian consulates in the country. Authorities in Berlin said it was in response to the execution of Iranian-German prisoner Jamshid Shamad, who was kidnapped in Dubai in 2020. His execution followed a trial last year that Germany and international rights groups dismissed as a sham. According to the Iranian judiciary, Shamad was put to death in Iran on Monday on terrorism charges. Iran accused him of planning a 2008 attack on a mosque that killed 14 people, including five women and a child. Tehran claims over 200 others were injured in the attack. Now let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side.
Welcome back. Volunteers of different ages are planting saplings across Iraq in campaigns aimed to fight climate change and global warming. In a barren and shadeless area of Basra in Iraq, a group of environmental hobbyists and volunteers are attempting to fight the effects of rising temperatures and urbanisation that have been the catalyst for desertification in the country. In recent years, Iraqi agriculture has suffered from a lack of rainfall linked to climate change. Less water is flowing through its two main rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and decades of conflict has interfered with cultivation. Ali Hassim is founder of the Eternity Project, which is hoping to reverse that through afforestation. In Basra, campaigners say mass pollution has meant they must use a forest system to prevent damage to new plantings, but that requires manpower, which Hassim found through reaching out to hobbyists on social media. Ali Mana is a volunteer. The United Nations puts Iraq among the five most vulnerable countries to climate change globally. Separately, the Iraqi Prime Minister and the Ministry of Agriculture, in collaboration with other entities in the Iraqi government, have launched various other afforestation campaigns across the country. And finally tonight, Japan's Lignosat will test wood's resilience in space that could lead to a new era of more sustainable, less polluting satellites. It might just make space exploration a little more sustainable. Scientists in Japan are set to test the world's first wooden satellite. The Lignosat was developed by a team from Kyoto University and home builder Sumitomo Forestry. It will be launched next week atop a SpaceX rocket bound for the International Space Station. Former Japanese space shuttle astronaut Takao Doi was part of the Kyoto team. Lignosat, named after the Latin word for wood, will be released from the space station in the coming weeks. It will orbit for six months, testing how well the material can withstand the extreme environment. Forest science professor Koji Murata says wood can actually perform well in space, as there's nothing there to make it rot or catch fire. Wood also offers benefits at the end of the satellite's life, when it will burn up harmlessly in the Earth's atmosphere. Traditional satellites burn up too, but give off a shower of polluting metal particles when they do. Looking further ahead, Doi sees the satellite as a step towards a bigger dream. He wants to plant trees and build timber houses on the Moon and Mars. And with that, we wrap up today's bulletin. Join us again tomorrow for the latest updates from around the world. Stay tuned as we've got Anuradhi Vikram Singh joining you next with the nightly business report. Until then, thank you for watching and have a good night.